Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Jake Taylor, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our session on uh, Tools of the Trade, where we're going to investigate how technology and public purpose have a role to play in science and technology policy. At the Belfer Center in the Technology and Public Purpose Project, we've been spending the year zooming in on the question, how do we enable and align new technologies with outcomes that are gonna be good for Americans and good for the world? I'm thrilled today to have someone here who has worked on this question at the highest levels. I'd like to introduce Michael Kratzios. Michael was the fourth uh, chief technology officer of the United States uh, at the White House. And, and as the president's top technology advisor, Michael led the development and execution of the nation's technology policy agenda for the entirety of the Trump administration. Michael also served as the acting undersecretary for defense and under his leadership, the White House launched a variety of national initiatives on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, 5G, broadband and autonomous systems, a category that Michael championed under the rubric of industries of the future. I had the pleasure of working with Michael directly during my time at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and saw firsthand his tireless leadership on these critical areas. Michael is, of course, distinguished by more than just his government service. He's uh, named to the Fortune 40 under 40. He's uh, part of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leadership, recipient of the DoD Distinguished Public Service Medal, and his writings have appeared in a variety of journal, uh, uh, newspapers and magazines, including the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Wired, Bloomberg, and Fortune. Michael comes from South Carolina and is joining us uh, from there today. And he graduated from Princeton University, also served as a visiting scholar at Beijing Tsinghua University. Michael, you have the floor. Well, Jake, thank you so much for, for including me. I, uh, I had a, 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 a tremendous time over the last four years working on some of these very important technology issues and uh, and being able to spend some time with you talking about them and answer your questions. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad to be here. Wonderful. So uh, actually I wanted to start actually talking about maybe the core question which you've confronted over the past four years. And that's really, how do we enable new technologies for the benefit of America and our citizens? Um, and can you tell me and tell us a bit about your thinking on this critical question? Yeah, I think going, going into the administration, we had a sort of very unique opportunity and an opportunity to kind of set a technology agenda that, that could kind of, you know, help drive across, you know, a, a unified measure to help drive across all of, all of the agencies. And I think what we settled on, on very early was, was this idea of, of driving American leadership in, in emerging technologies, this, this core realization that um, what was critically imperative for our national security, for economic growth, for jobs um, and for the future of the country really depended on our ability to continue to, to, to drive our leadership position in, in so many technologies. And, and for us, I think, you know, for, for each of those, we had, we had a very, we had a, a number of sort of levers you could pull to kind of help, help drive that, that leadership position. And, and I think through all of our strategies, whether it was in, in artificial intelligence or quantum or 5G, um, we really thought about it through, th through a couple of lenses. And I think that the, the first, which, you know, I, I think has always been kind of core to, to, to American technology policy has been research and development leadership. This idea that the federal government has a, a very important and distinct role to play in funding early stage, basic pre-competitive R&D. So we as administration, what can the federal government do to help coordinate those uh, basic research um, R&D efforts? Um, and we can certainly get into a lot of details of the various mechanisms you can use, you can use to do that. The second is, is often around, uh, has always been around regulation. How do you remove barriers to technological innovation in the, in the United States? Um, so you can think of, of sort of technologies and in generally in, in, in two categories, ones that are, are, are born in captivity or, or born free. And kind of regulations play an important role for both of those. So if you think of the world of, of drones or autonomous vehicles, those are technologies that are born in captivity without the FAA providing regulatory guidance on how to fly your your, your UAS, you will not be able to actually do that. Um, or you can think of technologies like the internet or certain aspects of artificial intelligence, those are born free and those will continue to kind of move ahead um, without any regulatory oversight until, until the government does something. So thinking carefully as regulators on, on how to deal with those two different types of technologies can be very important in, uh, in, in driving innovation. Um, 
the, the, the third kind of axis uh, is, is, uh, is usually around, or we've, we've centered it around or centered around uh, workforce. And that is how do we prepare Americans for the jobs of future, which will one, not only be able to, to, to leverage these new technologies, but also how do you sort of train and equip workers or even students to, to, to be able to be the ones who make the next, next breakthroughs in these fields. So from a public policy standpoint, it's looking at the dollars we spend on, uh, on, on college scholarships, on, on training programs and finding ways to be able to direct those towards the most important industries that, that we care about as a country. Um, and the fourth, uh, and one that, that we really you know, pushed hard on in the last few years has been on international engagement. This, this belief and understanding that um, as, a, as a country, we need to partner with like-minded allies to drive our leadership position, these critical technology, especially in technologies where some of our adversaries are, are spending a lot of money and potentially looking through, looking at these technologies through very different um, sort of values through a values lens or value proposition. So for us and th through all the efforts we, we've done over or did over the last few years, it's it's really about about R and D, regulations, workforce, and international. I think that's a good a good framework we use across uh, quite a number of technologies. That's thank you so much. I think that's actually really uh, helpful. I particularly like because uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot at the Dolphin Center and at this Technology and Public Purpose Project is what regulation wins. And your framing of born in captivity and born free mm -hmm. is, uh, is a really uh, helpful component of that. And uh, of course, uh, one of the things that, you know, we've talked a little bit about the driving thesis, right, which is that emerging technology is, is the future mm -hmm. of the American economy and for the American worker. But, um, but one of the things that, that I really wanted to kind of dig in on uh, in, in, that, in that space has to do with actually, you know, when we talk about R&D leadership, in coordination, there's choices that are made, mm -hmm. you know, about, about what direction and, and why. And I love if you could break down a little bit, you know, what went into your thinking of why, why, these, why these particular topics? And you don't have to be specific about them, but like, what was the thinking behind it? And how does this reflect, for example, you know, the needs of, of the few, uh, a few entrepreneurs who want to do a particular thing versus the needs of the nation and, and those who are in the electorate? Yeah, so I, I think what the first thing to, to always remember is that the, 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 before you do any of this calculation, you have to think very carefully about what role the federal government plays in the larger research and development ecosystem. And that's kind of the, the first principles question. Um, if you rewind maybe like 50 or, or 60 or even 70 years ago, the, the percentage share of total R&D that was of the United States that was funded by the federal government was well over 50%. Now we're well under 50%. And what's happened um, you know, over you know, since World War II essentially is that the private sector has stepped in to do a, a great deal of recent development that it was wasn't doing previously. So as being sort of responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars, we have to think carefully around ensuring that the dollars that we do spend are not duplicative or are, are going into areas that, that the private sector would have been um, would have been spending or nonprofits would have been spending um, if we hadn't put the money in. So I think what so that really tends to often guide the conversation around the best place for federal funding to this area of basic you know, pre-competitive um, research and development. This is stuff that the private sector isn't incentivized to, to really go into. So that's kind of the, the, the first thing we sort of look at. And then the second was, was figuring out which are the, the technologies which are going to have the biggest and most important impact on, on the country itself, and then matching those with the, the statutory sort of uh, limitations and directions of individual agencies. So another thing that, that's really unique about the way we kind of put together sort of these national strategies is that unlike most countries in the world, we, we do not have a ministry of science or a ministry of technology. Um, even many of our sort of, you know, uh, closest allies and partners, that is, that is the structure they tend to use. There's one agency that divvies out money to, to biologists, to, to people doing AI and everybody in between. And we have a very different model. We have the you know, Department of Energy that has its national labs. We have a National Science Foundation to sort of 
broad swath of basic research. We have NIH that spends, you know, $40 billion on, on health research. And, and we have DARPA that does sort of um, it, 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 its own important early stage work that can lead to some, some outcomes that can help our warfighter as well. So to us, it's, it's understanding how the pieces of the puzzle fit together and making sure that once we have as a, as a, as a country kind of identified the, the, the most impactful and important technology we have to lead on, that we can pair them with individual agencies that, that are able to make the biggest impact in, in driving those discoveries. I think you, you may be on mute, Jake. It couldn't, we have to have that at least once in a Zoom call. <laughs> so I know that some members of our audience actually uh, are studying science and technology policy, studying American government, trying to figure out you know, what they're doing here at the Kennedy School. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you know, what you just described as sort of meta picture is very, very helpful. But then there's also sort of the, the in the weeds, uh, getting to one of the most critical documents of any administration about science and technology, which is this uh, research and development priorities memorandum. Do you want to talk just a little bit about, about that document and kind of you know what goes into it? Yeah, absolutely. I think it was it, it, it's something that unless you're sort of in, in, in the weeds in S&T policy in Washington, you have probably never heard of this memo, but it actually plays a, a very critical role in the way that, that budgets are shaped towards science and technology. And it's called the, the Recent Development you know, Priorities Memo. It's, it's co-signed by the, the head of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and, and the White House Office of Management and Budget. And what, what usually, I guess, rewinding a little bit, budget cycles tend to be really, really long. So the, 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 the president um, submits his budget sort of request or proposal to Congress, usually in the, in, in the first quarter of, of a, a given calendar year, usually in, in, in February. And, and, but the, 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 the process that individual agencies to start sort of generating that budget to get it to the White House, to ultimately get it submitted, starts much earlier, sort of like in, in, in the summer of, of the previous year, even earlier than that. So the, the, the way that you tend to influence that budget is to be able to, to sort of give, give high level direction from the White House and from the president to the agencies on what the priorities are in the, in, in the summer before uh, the, the, the budget is due to Congress. So given that timeline, the director of, of, of OSTP and, and, and the director of OMB work together to, to, to formulate an R&D priorities memo. And this memo tends to generally lays out what are the, the, the core areas of science and technology and recent development that the administration wants to, to prioritize. So an example of something that we did, which never been done before, was actually uh, including machine learning and artificial intelligence in an R&D priorities memo. And as years progress, we include some of our other key priorities like quantum information science and others. And what ends up happening is these memos are then sent to the heads of, of individual departments and agencies. And then as those budget teams are starting to put together what the package looks like that they submit to the White House and ultimately to Congress, uh, they use that as sort of their, their North Star and, and, and guiding light. And if you sort of, what, what's fascinating to see from the inside is, is you know, in, in the fall when individual agencies, you know, come to OMB and present sort of their first draft of what their budget should be, you can really see the impact that the R&D priorities memo has because they often, and sort of frame the way th their investments to, to match the language and the priorities that are in that memo. So it actually, there, there's a lot of power in being able to, 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 to use specific words and, and, and areas of, of, of focus that you want because it tends to be manifested in, in what ends up making its way back, back to the budget, budget itself. And what you tend to see is also this sort of um, uh, it, it improvement cycle within administration. So if you go back to the, to, to the first R&D memo that the Obama administration put out and compare it to the one they put out you know, eight years later, you see a lot more maturity and thought, a lot more specificity than, than maybe you would. And I think the same would go with the ones that sort of we put out in 2017 and, 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 and the last one put out last summer. So administrations tend to start understanding and how, how the agencies work, what the priorities are. And you tend to have sort of much more robust specific memos as as uh, administrations progress. Thank you. That's, of course, uh, the, the backstory here uh, for me is that one of the reasons I ended up working at OSDP was because in the summer of 2017, an R&D priorities memo came out uh, that I saw, I found on my Twitter feed of all things, which talked about how quantum information science was a key priority. And of course, that's my research field before I started working in the policy space. And I got kind of excited and interested. So it's not just shaping the 
the guidance of the, uh, the agencies, but also perhaps potentially individuals. Uh, so so I, I really appreciate that, that dive in sort of the public purpose, uh, the, the framing of, of science and technology policy and your perspectives on it. Um, I, I would like to pivot a little bit now to something you touched upon earlier, having to do with what's happening in the international space. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, been a key theme in technology development for, for decades that we in part develop technology because of the competitive nature of the global environment. Some of that competitive nature is uh, military and some of that competitive nature is economic and some is cultural. But one of the questions that we keep running into is, is what does it mean to have the technology developed in America versus in one of our competitor spaces. And also, you know, how can we, by developing here, sort of counter some of the values that we consider important to the American way of life? Uh, and I'd like to get, you know, maybe some just initial response to that, and then we can maybe dig in a little bit as we go into some of the more specific directions that, that can be positive there. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think once you start realizing the the use cases that a lot of these a lot of these emerging technologies, you you suddenly become to realize how how important you know our values here we have in the United States and many of our allies share around the world are kind of important to the to, to the development of this of this technology. And you know, one of the the, the theses we had um, early on was we have to find ways to, to to bring along our partners and allies to to ensure that these values continue to underpin the development. Of, of these technologies. And if you zoom out and think about, you know, what is, what is the, 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 the best way to ensure that, um, that uh, you know, all, that, that these technologies are developed in, in, in a way that matches with our value set, the best way to do that is to ensure that these technologies are built and created in, in, in the United States and, and, in, in, and, and in, 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 in our home ally sort of countries. So, you know, how do you do that? We go, go back to the same plan we've always laid out is, you know, focus on recent development, ensure, you know, we have the right regulations in place, prepare your workforce, and then create these partnerships with other, with other countries to execute on that. So then you think about sort of brass tacks, if you, if you, if you have that theory, what is the way that you can sort of bring allies along? And I think for, for us, and what we tend to do was like, look, look for or organizations that uh, include our allies and partners and, and sort of leverage those organizations to, 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 to create uh, agreements and, and, and partnership documents which, which allow and sort of um, um, pu publicly talk about these value sets. So um, a great example of this was a lot of the efforts we did around, uh, around the OECD and, and the, the first set of AI principles. So up until a few years ago, the United States had never, as a, as a country, uh, a government, agreed to uh, an international set of AI principles. Uh, and it was it was very important for us to to be able to to bring together our, our like minded partners and allies who shared our values that we want underpinned in, in AI um, to, to sort of put together the first set of AI principles and and we did that at the at the OECD and, and had them signed and I think what what's important to remember is that there, there's other countries around the world that maybe would be interested in joining these principles but since they don't sort of observe them or, or, or follow them they wouldn't be able to so in a way we sort of we we create a a, a Club of, of 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 folks that that all sort of share these same values, and we use this to, to kind of our, our our benefit as 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 whole. So that's a, a I, I appreciate the framing going back to your original points about what the U.S. government does in terms of R and D regulation, workforce partnerships, and then of course in the international space, not going multi, you know individually bilaterally to each entity, but instead looking for this shared space that may already exist where we can together promulgate values that make sense to us. And I guess that both of these things, though, connect to a fundamental challenge with, uh, say, 50-year-old picture of how we do this versus how we do it today. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, that our corporations are multinational. Our supply chains are distributed our uh, workforce is multinational. And I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, what, what are the pathways or approaches that you look towards so that this multinational, multinational landscape 
more closely hues to the values that we consider to be most important. And I, I realize that there's a lot of tools in the toolbox and you've talked about some, I'm curious if, if you can maybe dig in a little bit uh, you know, on that, particularly maybe either on the workforce question or, or perhaps um, in, in other angles. Yeah, I think there's a couple. I think, um, you know, the, the first thing we care about, or I, you know, I would always, I was pr pr proponent of was recent development is key to almost everything else. You must be the home for the next great technological discoveries, and you need to create opportunities for these breakthroughs to happen in our most critical technologies here at home in the United States and at, at the home of our, our partners and allies. So how do you do that? You look for sort of R&D partnerships in places where um, you see sort of common, common purpose. And, and a lot of countries are interested in AI, but a lot of them have, have different sort of um, areas that they particularly want, want to focus on. So an example that, that the US is often interested in that we could partner with our allies on is this question of um, uh, explainability, for example. So in the world of, of, of regulations, wouldn't it be nice if you could mandate that AI algorithms need to be explainable? But we know that's technically not feasible at the moment. So being able to, to join with, with our partners partners on doing explainability research is a, is, is a great example of, of this work. Um, another one that I worked on a little bit during my time at the, at the Defense Department is this question of, of 5G and how that impacts our, uh, our warfighters, both here, both, both American warfighters and also those from, from, from our partners. So if you want to create a safe and secure 5G network that can transform the way that military operations are done at, at bases or anywhere else, you know, you need to, you can partner with your allies to do that research together. And there may be, you know, places in the United States where our allies could come and work on it together. Or we could go, we could go abroad and, 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 and do that, do that as well. So th those are a, a couple, a couple of examples, but, but I think kind of what sits on top of all that is, is you need some sort of structure or framework, which sort of brings people together and is a forum where these types of ideas can be exchanged, where people can understand and, and better, better understand what are the types of similar problems they're working on and solve them together. Together. And our approach to that in the world of, of AI, to focus on that one a little bit, was the, the creation of the Global Partnership on AI or, or GPAY. And that was something that was launched at the, at the uh, you know, uh, G7 that was hosted by, by the United States last year. It was an, an idea that was conceived by, by the G7 nations and was, was kind of very excitedly kind of pushed along by both the Canadians and the French. And we ultimately came to a point where we needed this organization. It's, it's kind of housed technically at, at the OECD, but it's a forum where we can bring like-minded partners together to talk about these important issues, do, do the hard research that's necessary to inform policymakers and do it in a forum where we're, we're not working in silos, but, but working together. Thank you. That's, yeah, I feel like uh, there's a lot of opportunities there and it's something that we're gonna keep coming back to uh, in, in the world that awaits us. Uh, one of the things that we talked near the beginning was about the civic areas, these industries of the future, uh, which have, you know, they're still a, a key driver in uh, today as they were uh, three years ago, four years ago, when you really started putting them together. And um, I think that, you know, when I look at it and, and the conversations we've had uh, this, this year, I've been at the Gulfer Center, it, it really connects to this ever balancing question as, as uh, Secretary Carter put it between statism and the uh, pure private sector. And so, you know, clearly when we're at the US government's highlighting particular industries, we're, we're making a, a stance. We're saying it's not pure private sector, it's this public private integration. And I would really uh, love to get a sense from you kind of if you look at industries of the future, you know, what is it that you're looking at for how the government and the private sector can support each other. Yeah, I, I think what we have seen over the last, you know, four or five years has been this, this, this um, sort of unifying kind of almost bipartisan um, approach to the way that we should drive innovation. And I think you, you were a big part of this story with the, the National Quantum Initiative Act and kind of in, in, in the last days of, of, the, of the last administration, the, you know, the, 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 an equivalent bill around artificial intelligence was, was, was also passed. And I think in both of those cases, what you tended to see was, was Congress very in a bipartisan fashion making the argument like, look, we need to lead in these, in these particular domains. And the way we need to do it is by being smarter about the way that we bring together the private sector, academia, 
um, the federal government uh, in, 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 in helping accelerate these breakthroughs and, and, and being able to, to kind of move from basic research discoveries into ones that are actually taken up by, by the private sector. So what, back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, the, the U.S. has a very unique approach to innovation, one that's, that's very different than many of our, our, even some of our allies or our adversaries, and that is that we have this very free market approach to innovation. We have the federal government working on some, some really cool basic you know, early stage research stuff. We have the private sector trying to do more, more late stage stuff. We have academics who are often funded by the federal government to drive some of this research. And, and how these different pieces of the puzzle all, all fit and tie in together is what, is what makes the, 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 the US innovation ecosystem so strong. So as a, as a government, what, what we should think a lot about is how do you build, how do you, how you form those relationships and those bonds between those different pieces of the puzzle and make them a lot stronger. So take, for example, the National Quantum Initiative Act. What that mandated by law was the creation of these, of these quantum institutes. And again, by law, you had to have monetary contributions from the private sector into, the, into whatever the bid was that ultimately was selected by, by the Department of Energy. So you couldn't even stand up the institute unless you actually had skin in the game from non-federal players. So what that does is it sort of, in a way, sort of pushes these different pieces of the ecosystem to, to, to work together and, and more in concert. And it's something that, that, that you know, we are very convinced is gonna, is gonna play out and be, be successful in, in, the years, in the years ahead. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, my own experience in that particular space led to one of my first policy briefs here, which was talking about the role of consortia mm -hmm. play, uh, gatherings of private sector under a government umbrella. Uh, primarily focused, as you mentioned earlier, on this pre-competitive area, yep. right? And so it, it does kind of come to a question which has to do with, um, uh, in some sense, an infinite amount of competition might be too much competition, you know, particularly before you can sell a damn thing, pardon mm -hmm. my language. Uh, but, you know, after, you know, after you get a product, then of course there's more and more opportunity for the private sector to take an increasingly strong role in, in it. And I'm kind of curious, you know, when you contrast that with, for example, China's approach, uh, you know, what, what is it that um, that's going to distinguish America in this space? Well, it, 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 in that, I think that the key thing to think about there is, is a, a free market approach to innovation is one that tends to direct dollars towards areas that will ultimately prove most successful. And I think we have a, a history in the United States of, 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 of attempting to, to quote unquote pick winners and losers sometimes. And we don't necessarily have, have the best the best track record around it. So, you know, rather than, than having sort of a, a, a bureaucrat in Washington trying to, to choose the best late stage company to, to invest in, if you can create models like these consortium and like these institutes, what you end up having is a is, is a closer relationship between the, the funders themselves, the, the the Feds, with the 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 the, the technology, the, sort of the smart sort of academics and people who understand technology from universities with the actual people who will ultimately be required to, to, to commercialize it and actually make, make money out of it. So I think you with that sort of close interlinking between the parts of the, of the ecosystem, you end up having sort of much stronger and, 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 and better, better decision-making. I think, you know, th th there is a world where, you know, you, you can, you can see why sort of this, this heavy handed industrial policy from, from countries like China kind of makes sense in their eyes, like in, and, you know, if you're, you're sitting in leadership there, you know what's best. You can sort of direct individual companies to, to pursue those. But I think um, long term, that's not something that's going to that's going to lead lead to success. And I think with us, we can we can essentially be 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 focusing our sort of federal resources on areas that we think are most important through mechanisms like the R&D priorities memo. But we're not necessarily going to, to, to the to the far extreme where we're actually, you know, directing individual companies to do things. That does actually bring me kind of to my next area of question, uh, which is the large, last main one I want to talk about in our time together today. And that has to do with actually the overall tools we have mm. for setting policy and having policy respond to the changes in the technology landscape, the changes in the multinational and, and global landscape. And uh, it's actually something that's been a subject of a recent blog post, which goes up uh, this week. Um, where I talked a little bit about some of the tools that we've used, for example, at uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. But I guess, you know, coming back to the fact that there's students on this call who are, who are learning about how you execute policy, maybe 
it would be helpful to talk a little bit, you know, starting first with, for example, this Industries of the Future space and how do we make certain that this government component and the private sector component adapt and evolve together. Mm -hmm. And then we can zoom out a little bit and talk about some of the other mechanisms we have for coordinating, convening, and otherwise integrating disparate voices. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is to is to be connected with the community that that you're trying to impact. And um, I think that goes for individual agencies that that are trying to, to, to push forward programs. And, and it also applies to to organizations like like the White House that are looking more sort of holistically at at, at, at the landscape. And I think when when I look back and, and I think about kind of one of our most sort of successful policy initiatives and in, in were over over the last four years, they they all kind of began with a a a, a real um, concerted attempt to, to, to convene the relevant stakeholders together and get an understanding of where are the places that the federal government can help plug into and assist in the larger in the larger ecosystem. So, you know, a year before the first executive order around artificial intelligence was was signed, you know, we had a, a very large scale event at the White House called AI for American Industry, and we brought together AI leaders from the tech space, from agriculture, from health, from transportation, and we had a, a very long and robust conversation around around what was it that the U.S. needed to do to, to win in this field, and where could where could the federal government help, and kind of. Based on those those types of conversations, ultimately was able to to kind of drive us to to to, to a place where where we wanted where we wanted to be, and and then you can imagine sort of the the executive order um, even tease out um, tease up even more opportunities for for community engagement, for example. So you know we don't have all the answers, and especially when it comes to technology policy, you know that's a place where we need the community more more than ever before. Um, the people in in Washington who are experts in this space are, are very limited, and it's critical that we kind of hear back. So a great example was um, the, 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 the first set of, of AI regulatory principles that were put out by the federal government in, in history were done, were done a couple of years, were done last year. And the, the, the process to do that involved, you know, us putting together a draft of some kind and then, and then putting it out for, for comment where we received a wide variety of comments from, from academics, from industry and so on, and being able to, to kind of work with the community through those and ultimately come up with a final set of rules was kind of, I think, what, what made them so, um, so, so good. So to me, I think it, everything around the world of tech policy needs to revolve around community engagement because they're the ones who are experts in these, in these fields and, and, and know much, much, much more than we do. So that then kind of takes me to the, the next question, which is, okay, so you, you convene this community together, you've learned from them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, what is, uh, first of all, you know, how do you maintain the enthusiasm I know one of the things you talked about a lot when we were at OSTP was a key selling point was points and wins, right? Keeping the, the drumbeat moving. And I'd love to hear more about that. And then the other thing is, again, evolution and sustainment mm -hmm. over the longer term. Uh, so you're building the community together once, um, you know, what's the mechanism for keeping, keeping that rolling? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. I mean, you, you have sort of there's the, the sort of the, the 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 bread and butter sort of communications types uh, or or outreach type organizations like FACAs that that are able to um, sort of pr provide um, you know it, it, it formal expert advice to the government on on these issues and and that's the kind of stuff that you need to need need to do with any type of initiative and you tend to see it baked into most most legislation for these large large technology initiatives. Um, but the, the second thing, which I think is, is really important and I think is, is underappreciated, is just general communications and sharing to the community of the type of work that, that you are doing. And I think when I look back about you know, why, why our first few years around our quantum agenda was so successful is because you and, and your team did a very, very, did the very, very hard work of trying to, to sort of put together and bring together a, a list and community of folks that cared about these issues, identify them, and then communicate to them in, in their language and the types of things that they want to see and, and understand. I think one of the, the biggest mistakes that can be made in Washington is, you know, you spend, you spend a year putting together some sort of initiative launch or an executive order, you have a big announcement that day, and then no one ever hears from you again. And that, that doesn't lead to, to long-term sustainability of the, of the program. And I I think one of the best examples, I think, is, is the way that we approached, approached AI. I mean, we started with 
a, a convening at the White House. Uh, we ultimately had a had an executive order that that came out, but that essentially just laid out a bunch of things that needed to be done in the future, whether it was new regs, whether it was like starting to actually measure the amount of R&D dollars that we were spending. It was forming formal committees at the White House to, to organize these things. And we were able to, to constantly share with the community and the world the progress we were making and in, in kind of driving to these to these aspirational goals of U.S. leadership, and in keeping the community engaged, whether it was whether it was Washington, whether it was actually Capitol Hill and, and legislators, or whether it was actual technologists. And I think that the proof that it actually made impact and kind of broke through was that you know when the the, the National AI Initiative Act was was passed into law just a few months ago in, in January, that essentially took our sort of uh, AI strategy or our, our, our sort of AI initiative and codified it into law. So it showed that, you know, we were able to spend about a year and a half or two years kind of talking about why it was so important and how actual individual agencies were executing on it, that, that it became the, the, the law of the land before, before we left. Thank you. That, yeah, that was, of course, a wonderful thing to see uh, that culmination just, uh, just at the end of the, the previous administration. Um, I, I'm going to turn in a little bit to some, some highlight questions, but I wanted to open up to the audience briefly. I know that there's been um, uh, so far only one question that, that's come in, and uh, the, you're welcome to send in more. And so uh, just really to give you a sense of, of the type of questions coming in, I think uh, the one that I've got right now has to do with um, you know, just working at, at OSTP, which is you know, how do you get involved in the science policy space and start to make that make that influence. I think there's a civic question like, can I get an internship at OSDP? But maybe there's a more general question, which is, what is the path to uh, doing executing science policy? Yeah, on the internship front, I, I recommend any of you who are interested to, to definitely uh, apply. I think it's just OCP.gov and, and there's an internship link there. Um, and it's a it's an extraordinarily rewarding place to work and, and spend time. Um, the issues that 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 sort of Jake and I tackled for years are, are ones that are unimaginably nonpartisan. These are these are topics that are sort of critical for the future of our of our country. And, and it's ones that you sort of have this this really amazing kind of 30,000 foot view on on sort of setting these 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 large sort of national level strategies and then working with individual agencies to to, to kind of um, execute them. I will say um, the, the what's unique about OSTP is is that it's a it's a very lean organization. The budget itself is you know less than five million dollars. Um, you know it assert it is essentially is a is a um, you know policy coordinating function across across the agency. So we're not giving out grants. We're not you know funding anything. We're essentially trying to to, to piece together the larger uh, initiatives that that then our agencies kind of kind of execute. So. Um, for those interested, you know, I would try to try to seek out and identify who who the the lead at OSTP is for for the particular area that you care about most. So the way that the teams are usually structured is uh, is you have a, a division head, and then under them you have a number of, of policy advisors or leads for individual policy streams. So there's a an AI lead, a quantum lead, a 5G lead, an entrepreneurship lead, and 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 goes on and on. And I think those people, um, because our organization is is so small are, are are very empowered. It is really a usually a one or two man show trying trying to do literally everything, and and these people tend to be um, extraordinarily talented. They're top in their field. Um, there's a sort of this, this hybrid of of being a a sort of scientist academic with being a policymaker, which is is can often be very challenging to get right. But once you find that person, they can be extraordinarily impactful. So to me, I would I would recommend definitely consider the internship and and definitely try to seek out and and, and figure out who who the lead is in the area you care about and reach out to them because I think they're, they're often looking for, 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 for help or for, for people that, 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 that can help push the, the agenda forward. Thank you. Um, I have a, another question, which comes back to some of our earlier conversation about competition with China. Mm -hmm. And it is really asking uh, about the partisanship in the United States and, and our competition with China, wondering if, uh, you know, for example, we're going to be able to compete with, with the level of partisanship that people are looking at today. And the example that, that uh, Simone uh, provides is an AI technology where China has rapidly approached, um, maybe uh, they, he calls a parity with the United States in a short amount of time. I, I think I wouldn't entirely agree 
that we're at parity, I think that there's a lot of uh, pressure coming in. So I'm kind of curious, you know, what is, uh, you mentioned before the role of bipartisanship, mm -hmm. um, is, the, is the partisanship is the, of the US system going to be a, a challenge uh, in these spaces? You know, I, in, in the world of ST, I'm not, I'm, not I'm not that worried about it. I think most of the, the legislation over the past few years, even during the last four years, that has, has centered on science and technology has been, has been very bipartisan. In an era where the left and the right tend to disagree on a whole bunch of things, uh, the one place that they, they tend to, to uh, traditional or, or consistently not disagree on is the importance of U.S. leadership in these, in these critical technologies. We saw it through the, the, the bipartisan um, sort of national Quantum Initiative Act. We saw it again through the Bipartisan uh, National AI Initiative Act. Um, we're seeing it with the, the, the New Frontiers Act, whom you may be tracking, which is a, a, a very, very expensive, large-scale sort of uh, expansion of, of, N of NSF's remit in order to do, to, to do more sort of l later stage type, type, type work. Um, that's something that has sort of, sort of bipartisan co-sponsors. Um, so if anything, I think that the numbers that, that we're seeing in the, in the progress or, or the attempts that, that China is making to, to kind of catch up to the United States, I think is, is, is nudging a lot of legislators to, to continue to find ways to, to, to produce legislation which moves, moves the needle forward for, for the United States. So if anything, I think, I think we're lucky to work in a space where, where we can kind of sometimes put, put that, that, that partisanship aside and, and be able to put wins on the board for, for science and for technology. Thank you. I think I have time for, for one last question. Um, uh, and uh, one has, to, uh, this is pretty tricky. So I guess I'll just kind of have the, the broad question, which is, um, you know, is, <laughs> and things move fast in technology. And I guess the question is, you know, how does the government keep up? Well, I, Jake, we have to we have to hire more people like you at OSTP <laughs> to keep up. I, I think I think the answer is we, we just need to continue to attract high level talent to, to to the USG, and it's something that continues to be a problem not only at at, at kind of the, the highest levels like, like like the White House, but also at at individual agencies where we're, we're, we're constantly talent talent constrained. So thinking creatively about the, the the types of programs that we can put in place at the federal level to attract top level talent, whether it's for tours of duty for a year or two, some types of fellowship programs, whatever it may be, having really having the, the smartest and best and brightest Americans working for the federal government is something we should all strive for. And I think all of us can agree is important. Um, so I think I think just thinking more creatively about about some of these solutions to bring people on. I mean, we've seen this with the sort of presidential innovation fellows as an example. That's roughly, you know, 30 ish type people who get sprinkled out across across the agencies. But I think there, there, there are ways that we could do we could do even more. Actually, I can um, I can pitch um, my fellow TAP Fellows project, Mark Lerner, who's all about getting better talent in to make certain technology really functions. And uh, he was going to be talking later this week for those in the audience. So Michael, we're at the end of our time just about, but there's just enough time for one last question, which is you spent a long and hard four years working in, in this space. And I'm kind of curious, you know, what was a highlight? What was something that you're pretty, at the end of the day, you rest and say, you know what, we did good. Uh, well, I guess a couple of things. I, I think the, the first thing is I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of our Industries of Future agenda. We were able to create an umbrella initiative that, that captured kind of three of the most important areas the U.S. needed to lead on, which were artificial intelligence, quantum information science, and, and 5G. That agenda was one that was seen as very bipartisan. We had, as we've mentioned before, multiple bills passed in, into law, which essentially took up that agenda and, and, and made it the, the law of the land. And I think what, what I'm personally most, most proud of is, is it continues to be bipartisan. In, in the letter that, that President Biden wrote to, um, to Eric Lander, who is the, the, the nominee to run OSTP earlier this year, they specifically used the language industries of the future and, and they highlighted the, the, the same areas that, that we focused on. And I think that that's a that that's great sort of proof of the, of the type of work that we've been doing, that it is very bipartisan. Everyone wants us to win in this space and we need to continue to, to kind of find innovative ways to drive our agencies to, to, to ensure the next great discoveries are made are made here in the United States. So to me, what I'm most proud is, is, is sort of being able to take that agenda and ultimately putting it into law and, and now seeing it um, continue on in, in the years ahead with the new administration. Thank you so much for the answer. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you here today. Uh, 
again, if you have uh, further follow-up questions or the like, um, uh, we have no more time right now, uh, but I'm going to be switched over to uh, another guest in a moment who can help uh, dig through some of these questions with me. Michael, thank you again. And I really look forward to seeing some great things from you in the future. Thank you, Jake. It's been a pleasure. Uh, so my next guest uh, is Dr. Jennifer Shee. I'd like to invite her to, uh, to join me for the discussion now. Um, there you are, Jennifer, wonderful. So, uh, so Jennifer uh, is actually a chief scientist at the Small Business Administration, uh, where she advances technology commercialization uh, through the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Programs. Uh, for those of you in the audience, the acronyms SBIR and STTR are likely to occur in the course of our conversation, so I'm just priming you now. And of course, she also served as the Assistant Director for Entrepreneurship at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, where we overlapped. And there, she led the national efforts to improve the transfer of federally funded technologies from lab to market, along with advancing the coordination between the many different agencies that work in research and development and their infrastructure, and to champion open innovation through the use of prizes in citizen science. Previously, she managed uh, small business programs for the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute under the National Institutes of Health. She served as a program director at the National Cancer Institute and the SBIR Development Center. Uh, she joined there actually as a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, which is one of the pathways into the policy space that you can think about, those of you in the audience. And before that, she was involved in, pro in product and customer development at uh, Synapse, which was a, a, a startup company along with mobile games and uh, studied for a brain and cognitive science at MIT and did a PhD in neuroscience at Stanford and is a co-author of a textbook on guide to research techniques in neuroscience. So obviously a very distinguished guest and one that I'm thrilled to have here and to continue the conversation. Um, I will say, you know, speaking about more personally, uh, when I joined the Office of Science and Technology Policy, I knew basically nothing about innovation except all the ways that I had failed at doing it. And through Jennifer, I've had a chance to learn some of the ways you can successfully execute upon it. And so it's a real pleasure to have you here today, Jennifer. Uh, if you have anything you'd like to start off with, I'm happy to pass the floor to you. No, I mean, I, I really um, thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation because I uh, also really enjoyed hearing Michael's reflections on, on that time in, at OSTP. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, I will say we have a few questions from, from the audience we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to actually just get to those, get to some of that stuff. And, and, but first, I just wanted to give a, a moment to set the frame. And in particular, you know, you've been charged both at the sort of individual level, the agency level, and also the national level with putting together policy that enables innovation in areas that matter for the United States. And I guess it would be helpful to get, to get your sense, your vision of how does the government support those first steps of innovation and, uh, and, and the bridge that we try and make from you know, building some scientific knowledge towards technology, towards product. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, and I think a lot, of, a lot of my vision about the government's role in innovation has been shaped and it was definitely broadened by my time at OSTP and with the lab to market uh, cross-agency priority goal. And, you know, really it's, it's thinking about the government's role in R&D uh, and how do we think about that $150 or $150 billion of taxpayer dollars that go to support research and development. And, and what is the public purpose that we're, we're thinking about? You know, why would the government invest here? And about a, a third of that R&D, those R&D dollars are at federal labs, like yours at NIST, <laughs> and another third at universities which really um, mostly it, it focuses on the, the fundamental uh, research that underlies and, and is the foundation of that scientific discovery. And then another third actually goes to business. Uh, and that's geared a lot more towards the applied research and experimental development stage, though that's also where a lot of the investment from businesses themselves in R&D comes from as well. And I think there's a really key piece of the federal government that focuses a, a great deal on the technology side. Like we, whenever we talk about federal investment in R&D, 
it's a lot on the, the projects themselves and the technology. And we sometimes forget about the importance of the federal government in, in supporting the people side. So, you know, there's certainly the, the support of uh, the future scientists and engineers, but I think it's also in, in supporting innovators across the country, but there's also that really important role of inspiration, right? The government does big things that can't be accomplished by individuals. And so I think at its core, the government really serves as that connector piece uh, and serves as this, okay, we have the big picture. We know eventually we want to solve poverty or we, we want to improve people's lives. Um, and so starting that from the, the scientific aspect and thinking about all the different tools and places that the government has a role in playing, it's, it's being able to think about the people and the systems and bringing them together and having that public purpose vision from government and, and to serve all of our citizens, right? And work towards more equitable opportunity uh, and, and the development of technology that's going to be serving all the, the citizens that we have. That's a, that's a, a big vision, honestly. <laughs> uh, and of course you're at an agency that, that helps uh, make it happen. Um, and I guess I wanna actually dig in on that just a little bit, right? Which has to do with, uh, the core part of the program in, in this year, which is all about public purpose. And the first question you have to ask when you think about technology and public purpose is who defines what's public purpose? So I guess, uh, you know, I, I will say that within the public sector, right, we have different methodologies from R&D tax credits, which are entirely neutral to whether it's a public purpose or not. It's just, does it create economic growth? You know, to a very specific blue sky research. And, and I'm kind of curious if you can tell us a little bit about how the programs that you're involved in you know, integrate public purpose and, and the definitions of what's public purpose today into what they do. Yeah, definitely. So uh, this is where I will, I will try to, but I probably will be using the SBIR, SGTR acronyms quite a bit. Uh, we also refer to them as the America Seed Fund. Uh, so maybe that'll be easier to, to remember. Um, but America's Seed Fund right now is about $4 billion uh, of, of R&D funding that goes to small businesses to continue doing that, that R&D, to take the, the basic scientific discoveries and help move that discovery into the marketplace where it can have public purpose, major mission impact. And the thing about uh, the SBR and STTR programs, so it's actually all of that $4 billion comes from 11 different federal departments. So really uh, we at SBA don't actually have R&D money. Um, we, what we do at SBA is help coordinate across all those different agencies in terms of how they relate back to small businesses and, and potential entrepreneurs and thinking about how to translate their technologies. And so in terms of thinking through you know, the public purpose aspect, a lot of it is uh, the agencies themselves each have their own mission, right? So I formerly worked at the National Institutes of Health and our mission was improving human health. And it's a pretty broad, high level mission. Um, and so the character of the SBIR program at NIH is one that is very invest, invest, inventor and, and innovator led. So it's very open topics and, and we want at NIH, you know, we would want to hear what do you as an innovator have as a technology that's gonna advance and improve human health. And that actually contrasts from some other agencies that have more of a um, agency led topics that they know that there are these problems that they have and they need a solution, a technological solution to come fix that. And I'll, I'll bring the other, the, sec the biggest um, agency or rather department that participates in the SBIR and STTR programs, which is Department of Defense. And so there, it's also a, actually a really broad mission um, to protect <laughs> our national security Right, and um, the way they use the SBIR program 
also varies quite a bit within it. But one of the core things is that they may be an eventual customer. They would like technology that's going to be able to be applied to protect the warfighter. And so when we think about the different mission areas of the agencies, that's kind of how it, it will come and impact the SBIR program and the companies that are, are applying directly. And, you know, I think that's that customer pool aspect, right? So whether it's NIH or NSF or Department of Energy is another example where it's kind of the market uh, in, in a sense that that is where the eventual customer lives versus an agency as the eventual customer. Uh, that's one of the drivers of who determines what the purpose of those projects will be. So in some sense, uh, to kind of paraphrase, for agencies and departments in the government have mission. And that, that determines a lot of the specifics, both of, of where they're going to be trying to put R&D money, but also where they're going to be buying R&D product. And then coming back to the previous conversation with Michael, right, what sets the connection of those missions to the public is this political process, the R&D priorities memo process, uh, the convening and integration of public input. So it's uh, one of the challenges, and this is something that came up in the previous conversation, of course, is that all of these things take time, right? So, um, <laughs> so I know this wasn't one of the questions you prepared, but I'm kind of curious, you know, in these rapidly developing fields, so what are the, what are the tools, you know, that, that you can, the SBA or some of the other at the, at the bench level where you actually have individual groups that are going to be getting money like that what are the tools that can be brought to bear to handle some of that rapid change yeah and and you know i think that that is a huge challenge um now i mostly look at this from the uh funding and and the funding side of of inspiring innovation and not unless on the regulation side for example i think regulations have a lot um, more difficult, uh, long timeline of, of adapting to the rapid pace of technology. Um, but on the funding side, which also, I mean, there are long timelines to allow for funding to actually happen. Um, you know, once something happens, once something goes into law, implementing something that is in law actually takes a lot more time than you might expect. Once it's a law, there's, you know, I always joke that there needs to be this follow up to the um, schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law to how a law becomes implemented. And that's like super long. In any case, <laughs> it's a real challenge, but I think those conversations among, you know, the policymakers, scientists, the different players in this broader ecosystem, that balance um, between the, what I was describing is, you know, how do topics even get selected as far as what's going to be funded? Um, there's that, the broad topics that can be the topics that are innovator proposed versus sort of the more agency led topics. I think that's a good example of where, you know, the, there, there can be a little bit more rapid turnaround and responsiveness to what's going on in the marketplace or what's going on in the broader field. So the portfolio includes both sort of directive and also sort mm -hmm. of open call based approaches. Got yeah. it. That's, that, that's helpful. And of course, uh, it, it's a critical, a critical point. Um, I think actually one of, the, one of the questions that came up in the previous conversation that we didn't get a chance to address, which does tie in a little bit with these is really about the picking of winners and losers. So, you know, on the one hand, as Michael was talking about, right, private sector does a, a free market style is contention, right? Does a better job picking winners and losers than a government bureaucrat can generically. But at the same time, right, we're supporting through these types of programs, you know, more specific directions. And I guess the question is, uh, you know, what, what is that balance in, in setting winning and losing? And I don't think there's a right answer here, by the way, but, um, you know, the, the point is, uh, you know, when we talk about the free market and letting it letting it evolve you know obviously there are some choices that we make there and i'm kind of curious do you have a sense of of how those choices are integrative of the free market benefits yeah i mean it you know and and i think when we one of the challenges uh is that there are so many nuances in, in the specifics and and you know the devil's really in the details of 
implementation, right? Because you think about, um, let's say DARPA or ARPA-E, uh, for example, in terms of how they even use the same mechanism to, you know, are, are you considering their selection of an awardee of that money to be a picking a winner or loser? I mean, obviously, I think one of the, the really public, uh, publicly known uh, investment of the federal government in Solyndra has been the one that keeps bringing up like the government's not great at picking companies that are going to be in a particular place. And, and I think Michael did bring up th that discussion around where in the pipeline or the stage, the technology stage or the maturity of a company, like where is it? appropriate for the government to be investing and to be saying that, you know, this company should win versus another. And, you know, so I think another, so that's, that's one where there's no, I don't think there's a really firm good answer because it really depends on what does the market look like for that particular technology? What stage of development is the technology in even within a field as a whole, right? Um, and so I think that one's a challenge, but I even want to go back to talking about, you know, the percentage of funding of, of R&D funding that's in fundamental research versus applied research, which, you know, I would consider SBIR to be kind of this applied research experimental development stage. Um, and what's the right portfolio balance there for federal government to be investing in, right? So SBIR, STTR, America's Seed Fund, that is 3.65% of an extramural, like the, the R&D funding of the federal government that goes, you know, out to uh, outside of the federal government. And is, is that the right balance, right? Other countries have different amounts, but this is, if this is the primary funnel point that we're, we're trying to look at the 97% of R&D funding that goes through this to become commercialized, you know, is that the right amount? And I, I don't know, there isn't a right answer for that either, <laughs> I think. Well, it's, it's a very pertinent question given the bills pending in Congress, which are going to be putting a lot more money in the technology development side than the fundamental science side. And obviously, mm -hmm. this is going to play a more, an ever more important role. It does remind me, so another one of the fellows here in the top project, Liz Sisson, is working on the question of evaluating public purpose in the venture capital space. And so for those of you in the audience who aren't aware, of course, uh, the best money if you're a new company is SBI or STTR money because it's non-dilutive. The government doesn't take a stake in your company, right? Uh, and so, um, so I guess I'm kind of curious you know, as as we look at this reevaluation or realignment of uh, how we do technology development through various bills and, and infrastructure and other things that are being proposed, uh, you know, is is this small business support direction, right? Is is that where we have the biggest bang for our buck? And if so, um, you know, are there missing pieces that we can bring to the table that will amplify or improve those outcomes? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the core pieces to also think about again is that ultimate what kind of public purpose do we have, you know, what kind of public purpose are we looking for, and I think right now when we look at the American Jobs Plan, when we try to think about what we need right now is um, a big infusion of economic recovery. Right. It, then if what we're trying to say, the, the more important things that we're trying to look at at the moment is a little bit nearer term, it, that one, maybe maybe there is something to be said about trying to do a little more to, to focus on let's do the translational technological development side or kind of push a little on that end. But the, the really core piece is that we don't lose the fundamental research aspect, because you can't, you know, it's the, the whole uh, eating the seed corn <laughs> um, analogy where it, we, I, the, one of the core challenges, I think, of kind of corporate investment in R&D in general has been that, uh, or not investment in R&D, but just corporate investments in general has been this push towards the short term and not understanding or thinking about what the long-term is looking like, right? And, and that's why I think one of the things I really value about the, 
the proposal and the, that key piece about public-private consortia is that you bring all those stakeholders with the different differing views together to try to map out what that timeline or system would look like, right? Where, where can we collaborate best to figure out how we get to this utopian world in the end where everybody is healthy and happy? Um, at least and a better so, yeah, a better world, right? And and yeah. I think that's the key piece too, is in that the the customer stakeholder engagement piece. And one of the key one of the key people or customers that, that sometimes gets lost in the conversation, but I think there has been a greater move towards it, and I think it is an important role for the government to play, is making sure that the people who are impacted by the technologies themselves are part of the conversation and that we think more broadly about that, engage more people also in the technology development side. I mean, I'm certainly a proponent of that. Uh, my sort of most impactful policy brief from this year I've been at the Belfer Center has been about integrating these types of communities together through these things I call public purpose consortia, uh, which we have some examples of now we've implemented for the Quantum Economic Development Consortium or quantumconsortium.org and the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium so I, I, I'm a big fan of providing the framework spaces and the like. It does, however, connect to a question we have from the audience, uh, which has to do with some of the challenges with the existing approach, particularly for phase one SBIR program. So uh, you know, your agency has a mission, is to find a set of things it's trying to accomplish, it puts out a, a call. And there's a challenge that there may be some small firms out there that are capable of answering that call, but it's not directly matched to their technology solutions. And, and the question from James is, is really, you know, what's the best way uh, for firms to look at these opportunities or for the opportunities to be more closely shaped to the capabilities of the marketplace? Yeah, so, you know, um, I think that this is one of the things that it's, it's valuable to understand about uh, the SBIR and STTR programs in how the different agencies implement it, because, uh, you know, what I would say is, especially for phase one, um, there may be really specific, narrowly defined topics from certain agencies, but if really you have a high impact, uh, valuable technology you're developing and it, that's not matched to that particular topic that happens to come out, you know, in a solicitation, there are other agencies that have broader topics that are innovator led. So the National Science Foundation, they specify different topics, like they'll say something like they want machine learning AI related things, but it's up to you, the company to propose why that's something that's important. And if you don't even see your topic under the many different topics that are very high level and broad that NSF puts out for SBIR, they have one called other. So, so there, that one is pretty broad. U.S. Department of Agriculture, I'd also plug as like, you know, another granting organization that has very high level broad topics. And uh, one of the things that they focus on in, at USDA is actually rural community development. And so the, the innovation may not be the technology itself, but in the application of it to improve the lives of, of Americans living in rural communities. So thank you. That's uh, hopefully that's helpful also for the audience and not just not just me. Uh, I, I will say um, it sounds like there's a bit of a balance, right, between um, proposing something that you know you'll get the the thing for because you propose it very narrowly, and uh, making more of a shot in the dark, saying we believe this is good and uh, you know be our customer in some in some sense. And so obviously you know there's you can't have it both ways, right? <laughs> uh, so Although I will you know, say that there is <laughs> there, I mean, there are, I would say Department of Defense and NASA for that matter are thinking a lot more about the dual use technologies, um, yeah, right? So there's the technologies they're, they're looking for to um, integrate into systems that they'll be using themselves. So NASA as a customer and Department of Defense as a customer, but they also do want the companies themselves to be sustainable. Um, that's, you know, one of the, the, I guess, beauties of the U.S. innovation system, right, is that we are, are looking to empower innovators uh, 
to make use of their own technologies as well. And so NASA, the space, the commercial space uh, market is really growing. <laughs> and so um, that's something that they're looking to, to figure out, you know, how do, how do they play in this area, especially as one that, that's growing. Well, and it's worth mentioning for those who aren't aware, right, that, that NASA in particular has some unique authorities uh, for executing things that are a little bit different than other agencies, uh, which comes back to this sort of many missions, uh, many models approach for, for U.S. funding. I guess, you know, it does, it does sort of widening up the question a little bit. And by the way, uh, we can take probably one more question from the audience if, uh, if it comes up. Oh, there's, uh, there's one. Um, so we'll take this one more audience question, then we'll, we'll close up. So this is from uh, Kwang Yu Si, which is, uh, you know, is wondering a little bit about this intersection between uh, science and technology driven innovation and the, the broader uh, U.S. demographics, right, which is, um, you know, small businesses are tend to be local, uh, whereas the larger companies or corporations are multinationals by and large. And, uh, you know, what is it what is it that we do across our uh, developmental approach that makes certain that this sort of development maturation is, is, is more widely spread or harmonized across the country. And also, of course, that it benefits us domestically uh, rather than essentially exporting U.S. dollars to support other countries. So th thoughts there. Yeah. So the, you know, the small businesses that tend to be funded through the SBIR and STTR programs do tend to be, you know, they're small because they often are startups and not necessarily because they will remain small businesses on Main Street. Uh, we definitely support all, of, all types of small businesses at the Small Business Administration, of course. Um, but there are you know, different flavors of small business, I'd say, right? Um, but one of the key things that we do um, at SBA is to support the exporting of uh, small businesses that are located in the U.S. For the R&D types of entrepreneurs that are supported through America's Seed Fund, SBIR, and STTR, I'd say, you know, they they probably have um, because R&D and and there's a lot of international collaboration in the science community more broadly. They may be um, starting off slightly globalized, but there are um, various, you know. Uh, rules or policies to influence and make sure that, for example, the, the work is actually being done in the U.S. Um, there, there is uh, the kind of Buy American Act does apply <laughs> to, to all of the different federal contracting, um, federal contracting awards. Um, you know, one of the things that's also unique is just thinking about the tools you might have through terms and conditions of awards, <laughs> for example, uh, the terms and conditions of, of giving federal funding and what you can require or allow. But then one of the things that we think about at SBA is that balance between the reporting requirements and administrative burdens that are put on small businesses that are uh, for R&D funding and how we can, how we can minimize that so that at least there's there's space to to play there, um, but I guess one other thing I'd talk about too is on the SBIR and STTR side, uh, there's something called Phase Three, which if the government is going to be a customer and you're going to be moving into the federal procurement realm, uh, that competition in Phase One and Two actually allows for sole source procurement, and um, the reason I bring that up is some partnerships we've been working on with international or, uh, aid organizations, so USAID, um, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, to support SBIR developed technologies being deployed and adapted for uh, countries where there are aid product projects or MCC compacts. Got it. So we're, we're basically out of time. And so just to close, first of all, thank you so much for your time and thought. You know, what do you want the audience here to take away with them? Just one thing. If you had, if you had one thing that they learned, what would it be? <laughs> um, the importance of the government as a 
connector, connector body and the importance of connectors across all of the many different stakeholders um, that, that exist for technology and to make sure that public purpose is being met. So recognizing how important the connectivity is um, to integrate all of these different pieces in the system. Thank you again so much. For everyone who's listening today, I uh, really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, tomorrow we have another Public Purpose Week session. I encourage you to attend if you can. Details on the web. If you have questions for me, you can find me on Twitter at quantum underscore Jake. And uh, I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Jennifer Shee again for her time and really appreciate everyone's thoughts and questions. Have a wonderful day.